This is Chapter 5, Pain Assessment and Management in Children. So pain in children, just like adults, we're trying to get that pain intensity. And then we want to find out, are we at a, a level that they're satisfied with their treatment? Are they at an acceptable pain level? We want to find out what other symptoms they're having or other problems that are going along with the pain. How is the pain affecting their recovery? Are they able to get up and walk when they need to? Things like that. What's their emotional response to the pain? And if we send someone home with pain medicine, we want to know that they have the economic means to be able to purchase that pain medicine. So there are three ways to assess pain. Uh, behavioral measures physiologic measures and self-reporting measures. You're used to using those self-reporting measures as the best uh, way to assess pain and then back it up with physiologic measures. And that's also true with children, except if they're nonverbal, then we can't do self-report. So we'll have to just assess their behaviors and assign a pain score rating based on that. So the pain scores we use with children most often, um, the faces, you've probably seen that. If they're, and faces work over about age three. If they're over six to seven, they have to understand the value of numbers. Then they can use a numeric scale. Some will still like using that faces scale, even though they're, they could do the numeric. And what we use at Valley Children's for, for kids who are nonverbal, either because they're too young, um, or they're nonverbal, is the FLAC score. There are some other pain uh, scoring tools listed in the book. We won't talk about those. Here's our faces score. There's six faces from smiley face to sad and crying, from no hurt to hurts worst, and it's recommended that you use those terms right below there. Hurts a little bit, hurts a little more. Because if you ask a child if they're in extreme discomfort, they have no idea what you're talking about. And think about what words you use when you're asking for descriptors on pain. If you ask a child if their pain is stabbing, they're picturing a sword fight and somebody's stabbing them. So make sure you're using words that are not scary words. You notice these faces say you can either make this a 0 to 5 scale or a 0 to 10 scale. And at children's they do 0 to 10, so it's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. The other frequently used pain scale at children's is our behavioral scale, which is FLAC. So we're giving between a 0 and 2 based on the face, legs, activity, cry, and consolability. So, you know, the face, it looks happy to its on and off looking very sad to constantly sad. Legs. A child in pain will keep their legs either flexed and stiff or extended and stiff and they may switch between the two but it's never just kind of gentle fluid movement. It's that tight muscle either legs up or legs extended out. Activity. Are they just laying comfortably or are they shifting and turning and not able to get comfortable at all or uh, one would be kind of some of the time. Crying, again, no crying or constant crying, and one would be just some of the time. Consolable, if the primary caregiver is doing the things that normally work, walking, rocking, whatever, does that console the child? All the time, some of the time, none of the time. So you give a zero to two between a zero, a zero, one or two in each of those areas. So it adds up to between zero and ten. And here's the face of an infant in pain. You see how their eyes are scrunched shut, their nose kind of flattens out and their mouth gets big and wide and sort of squared. So when we're looking at a response to pain in a young child, they're going to get um, rigid and go between that pulling the knees up very stiffly and stretching out very stiffly. So it may kind of be thrashing, but it's that rigid, um, not fluid movement. They're going to cry. They're going to have that facial expression of pain. The nice thing with young infants, they don't make a relationship between the painful thing in your hand, an IV, an uh, syringe, whatever, and the pain. As they get a little older, they figure that out, but, but an infant 
you don't have to worry about hiding the item because um, they don't associate the item with the pain that's coming. Here's the face of a baby in pain and here they are again just a different angle. Now as a child gets a little older they do understand that what they see in your hand is painful so they're going to try and withdraw from get away from that thing so you do need to kind of hide it to the last second. They're going to cry, have that facial expression and try and physically resist. A child who's uh, just a little older so they now are verbal they're going to say ouch or you know that hurts whatever term they use. They're still going to cry and scream and thrash around and try and get away. They'll often push the item away. If they see that IV in your hand they'll push your hand away trying to get away from it. When they get to school age they often use this stalling technique. They'll ask you to wait till their TV show's done or wait till their mom gets there or wait till whatever. They are trying to wait you out forever. They're hoping um, they can keep stalling you and they'll avoid whatever is coming. It's okay to negotiate with them. Give them a little bit of control. Let them wait till they finish eating or till their TV show's done. But they're anxious about what's coming from the time they know it's going to happen until it happens. Letting them stall you for an entire day or half your shift, that just leaves them anxious for all that time. So you don't want to let them stall you forever. Um, these kids, you'll see them get very stiff and they may act, some of them are going to cry and scream and thrash and try and avoid and push away just like the, the younger children do. Adolescents ha are much better verbally so you'll hear um, them saying things that are just, you know, higher vocabulary. You're hurting me, you know, I wish you weren't doing that. Um, so they rarely fight and thrash and do those sorts of things, but you'll see their muscles become very tight and, and very tense. Um, occasionally, adolescents really hate being treated like a child, but occasionally they act like children, so sometimes you will see them revert to those childlike behaviors, but talk to them um, more like an adult than a child. In neonates, uh, when I first started at Children's long ago, uh, we used to, they used to say that neonates, particularly the preterm neonates, their nervous system just wasn't developed enough to, to feel pain. And every nurse said that that wasn't true, but there were some studies out there that said that, well, they've since done studies that show that's not true. Neonates, including preterm neonates, feel pain. If it's something that you expect would be painful for anyone, it is painful for them. The problem is how do you assess their pain when they're nonverbal? They can't give you that uh, 0 to 10 or point at a, a face. So we are going to use that FLAC score um, and again the, the problem is are they in pain or are they upset about something because babies cry when they're upset. But usually that consolability, those other uh, parts of the flack will help in differentiating pain from, from just other um, stress response. The problem with physiologic measures, they will back up your pain score, but a child's heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate will go up, their O2 sap might drop, all those things because they're mad, because they're frightened, any other stress response will cause those same physiologic changes that pain can cause. So um, physiologic changes are, are less reliable in children than they are in adults. When you have children who are, are cognitively impaired, especially significantly cognitively impaired, it's really hard to assess their, their pain. Um, so we really need to use the primary caregiver. They know what this child's behavior is normally like and they can tell us this is the way they always act when they're not at home and things are different or this is not the way they act, this is it, their pain response because we don't know that. Um, we are going to use the FLAC score with those kids but realize these kids are at a really high risk for being undertreated for pain. 
children in general are at high risk for being undertreated for pain. Parents are concerned about addiction. We can explain to them that physiologic addiction is totally different than psychological addiction. They may develop physiologic addiction if we have them on pain medicine for any length of time, but they need to be on that pain medicine to control the pain, lower their stress hormones, get them moving, all those things that can slow down healing if they're not walking, they're in pain and their stress hormones are up, those things will slow down healing. So we want to control pain in kids. That is not the same as psychological addiction. If they get physical addiction, we can wean them off so that they don't go through withdrawals. And again, that is not psychological addiction. Um, caregivers are often afraid to to give it because we know our opioids depress respiratory drive and we're worried about kids breathing. Um, again, we just need to watch and monitor for side effects, but we need to control their pain. So kids are at risk for under treatment of pain and cognitively impaired are even at higher risk because it is so hard to assess their pain um, and know is this pain or is this some other issue going on with the child. Complex and chronic pain, at, just like with adults, your physiologic measures really go away when you're talking about chronic pain. Um, so you won't get that backup of the, the higher blood pressure, higher pulse rate. We just have to trust what they're telling us is true because chronic pain, you kind of get used to it and your body quits having those same physiologic responses. In chronic pain, we want to get as good of a picture as we can. Um, and we need to really develop that good therapeutic relationship to get that. We want to find out what's when it started, what sort of pattern does it have? Is it in the morning or the evening or after certain things? What has worked to make their pain better before and what has caused it to be worse before? Are there any symptoms or other complications that go along with it? So painful and invasive procedures, we do quite a bit of stuff to kids that just plain hurts. Um, Post-operative pain, we expect them to be in pain after surgery. Burns are really painful when they heal. Lots of kids have headaches or abdominal pain. Um, really painful illnesses, sickle cell disease. When they're in a sickle cell vasoclusive crisis, it's incredibly painful. Cancer is very painful. End of life care, very painful um, most of the time when a child is at end of life. And we are not at all concerned about physical addiction at, at that stage. We are concerned about controlling their pain. We know if we're giving pain medicine, they develop tolerance. So we have to go to higher and higher levels to get the same level of pain control. We are okay with that at the end of life. Um, our goal at the end of life is to keep them comfortable. We're not worried about them developing tolerance and physical addiction because, I mean, they're dying. Pain is, is the, the real goal. And now we'll move on to pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic pain medicine on a different lecture.